Welcome to this public defense action of diseases by Associate Professor Paul Fries Nielsen, entitled Matrix Analytic Methods in Applied Probability. I hope it's right. <laughs> yes. With a view towards engineering applications. The thesis has been accepted for public defense in fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of doctor technicist based on the evaluation by a scientific evaluation committee and the subsequent approval by the academic council. The official opponents for this defense action are Professor Gila Tusch, University Libre de Bruxelles, and Professor Peter Taylor, University of Melbourne, who will be our first opponent. The chairman, chairman of the evaluation committee is Professor Knut Kovarsen from the School of Compute, who will also be making notes of today's session. We have not, with the exception of our chairman, received any pre-announcements of other persons who wishes to make comments or raise questions during this session. However, if you like to do so, this is the time to announce it. So if there is anyone who would like to ask a question of Bo or comment on his thesis, strictly speaking, it should be announced now, before we start. I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, if you reconsider during the session, I'll ask again after the formal defense action has taken place and give you a second chance to come up with supplementary questions. Uh, I should also inform you that some of you managed to receive a hard copy of the thesis, but it turned out that so many showed up that we ran out. But if you sign up down there, you just raise your hand in the corner there, then uh, those of you who did not get a thesis can have it sent to you. Excellent. Okay. I shall inform you that this defense action can take no longer than six hours. <laughs> I agree, it would be amusing if it actually lasted less. But, <laughs> no, I, uh, we're optimistic that it will be less than six hours. Uh, each opponent officially has 90 minutes, and then we can have questions from the auditorium. But let's see if we can manage to finish a little bit earlier. So uh, let's get started, and I will first ask Paul Fries Newton to present his work to you. He uh, has about 30 minutes, roundly speaking, to present his dissertation in words. So please, Paul, <coughs> the floor is yours. So, I should check that everything works. Okay, so welcome everybody, and I'm very pleased to see so many of you coming here. So I have tried, I have strived to make at least part of what I'm going to talk about understandable for a more general audience. However, this is also a, a talk which reflects, I guess, about 20 years of scientific work which uh, I guess that the presentation should also reflect. So please bear over that for those of you who are, might not be experts that maybe some of it is, is, is less obvious than, than other parts. So let's start with this first slide, just to info tell a little bit about what it's all about. So my work, the motivation for my work comes from the scientific study of cues. So what is a cue? Well, a queue can, in real life, well, a place where many of us will experience it will be in, in hospitals. We'll, when we arrive at an emergency uh, ward, we'll see that other patients have arrived before us, and we will have to queue for those. But also maybe less, may, less subtle and maybe less obvious to, to, to people not working in, in the field. Communication systems also contain queues because you will have um, messages waiting and, and, and so forth. 
So in order to analyze these kind of systems, you will have, well, what happens? You will have customers arriving. So we have an airport, and you have planes coming in. And if it's bad weather, they, they might queue. So then you have the runway, which would serve these customers. So you have these things. And then you would have questions. So you can see here, the person who is in charge of the hospital might have an idea of how large he should make his his or her emergency ward. And also, there could be some concern of how long the, the patients would queue. And you see some of these people up here seems to have been there a little bit long. There are other applications that just queues, which, which are related. And another very important uh, um, application, which is actually mathematically dual to, to the queuing, is risk. So suppose we are running an insurance company, then premium will be paid. And also, you have claims. You will see here that most of you uh, um, uh, are living in Denmark and were in Denmark last week. And we experienced that we had a little wind going over the country. And that little wind happened to cause some, some, some damage. And you see this lady standing here. If, if she is actually uh, um, has any economic uh, involvement in, with what you see on the ground, we hope that she paid her premium. But you see events like that it will be obvious for the insurance company to try to consider what is the risk that the company could actually go bankrupt and the company would like to insure itself against these things. So you see that what we need is some generic framework of describing the arrivals to this queuing system and also how would we serve this. So we need models for how should people arrive and we need models for how should people get through the system. And Last but not least, then we need to have an idea of how we should analyze the interaction. So that's where whole the, the action goes on, you could say. Well, there's a lot of modeling in the first two, but the interaction is, is crucial also. And then uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll show that, that the idea of queuing have actually led to ideas which can be used in, in other settings and other frameworks, and that will be the last uh, um, of what I'm going to, to present today. So last but not least, I should say with a certain kind of joy also that in this work, there's also a kind of part which is just mathematics in its own right. So there's been a lot of fun and interesting and sometimes uh, not so fun when, when it's challenging and you cannot get through. But in the end, it's rewarding if, if you solve the problems. So part of it is, of course, a study of mathematics, but all, all along with a view towards that the models and the research should be applicable in real society. So a little bit about what the thesis contains and about my work. So the thesis consists of 19 scientific uh, contributions. And they're all centered on, around a theme, which I'll hopefully be able to explain to you in, in a few minutes. But Besides that, the first one, the first main topic is what I've called system modeling. So this is very much directly related to the application of the, of the cues. So you will have the first thing is you have a system and you have a queue system, but then you like to see how will this system respond to different kind of arrival patterns. So could the arrival patterns vary a lot or would they be kind of more systematic? And how important is that for the behavior of, of the system? Then there are some more, more direct models. There are models of, teleco of mobile communication systems, and there are models of, of other systems. And one of my most recent uh, application areas is a term called model checking in computer science, where you make abstract mathematical models and try to verify whether your computer programs are working or not. So that's... Um, Hopefully, uh, um, what we'll see today is a performing computer system which will not lead us into the topic that Microsoft PowerPoint should have been model checked. So, besides that, there is a part of, of what I've done which is uh, um, quite uh, um, very much in the, you could say, the engine room of, of the methodology. So there are some contributions with some basic results. So we have these models. And there are some uh, happen to be small corners which had not been addressed. And they were addressed in this thesis. And then there has been a kind of mathematical riddle. 
So there was a certain kind of formulas which people knew to exist in a certain setting. And everybody would expect that they were also true in a, in a more generalized setting. And the thesis contains two uh, contributions to solve that that was actually true. So you, it was necessary to modify existing proofs in more or less uh, uh, um, extensive ways to show that this riddle was, was solvable in the affirmative way. Finally, out of the work, actually out of some work in the goal of estimating parameters in these models came the idea of analyzing several of these uh, um, times which we need as input to queuing models simultaneously, and we got what we would call multivariate models. So we have models which can describe more than one phenomenon, and here we are actually, this is now an open research area which is, well, actually just well, started like six years ago, and uh, uh, I at least have the hope that we will actually be able to move this field into much broader areas and use it for more general statistical applications. So having this introduction and hopefully set the scene for what it's all about, I'll start to be a little bit more technical specific, and I'll speak about the fundamental model, which is the, the model for everything, not everything, but most of what we are doing in queuing theory. So the thing that if you have some knowledge of physics you could think of is an atom. So an atom, if you take an atom, I mean, at least to my knowledge and to the extension that I have been able to search, I haven't honestly asked a really genuine physicist, but I've searched extensively on, on the net, so I think that it's reasonably safe model, that if you have a, an atom, you cannot tell its age. So it was probably created in some kind of a supernova explosion at some time. And, well, how old is it? You don't know. So in that sense, an atom is always as newborn. That must be fantastic, right? Think of that as a human. But, well, if the atom is radioactive, at some point, all of a sudden, it decays. So that means that the, it will, it's a big atom, it's a, a uranium atom maybe, and then it breaks down and we have, for instance, an emission of an alpha particle, which is uh, um, uh, the core of a helium atom. So let's see a little bit about how, how that could, could, could work. So suppose now that we have an amount of radioactive material, so now we have to twist the, the experiment a, a little bit, so we don't have just one atom, we have a, an amount of, of radioactive atoms, but there are so many that actually, uh, that one of them decays will not really influence on, on the whole story. So this, this leads to what you mathematically call a Poisson process, and the, the picture I have down here is that we have time here, and up on the y-axis, we will see how many atoms will actually have uh, decayed during a certain time. So you see here, as, as time goes by, you have these uh, um, blue lines parallel with the x-axis, and they have varying lengths. And whenever we have a jump upwards, as you, you see, as you see um, here, for instance, it corresponds to an, an atom decaying. And what you should try to see here is that you have great variability. So sometimes it takes quite a long time. Sometimes it's very short. And here, actually, we have three quite short intervals just following each other. So that's what we call a Poisson process. Suppose that we are now focus on just one of these time intervals. So we go back to the sort experiment of the lifetime of a single atom. Then the lifetime of a single atom can be pictured by this distribution. So what do we see in this, this picture? Well, we have here that I have here a, a quantity which I have termed by x, and what is x? x is a mathematical model for a quantity which we have not observed yet. So it's something to be the lifetime of, of, the, of the atom, and we don't know what it is. So mathematical modeling, applied probability, is then about having ideas. We have mathematical symbols. So how come that we can do anything with these things? That's because we have rules. So we have mathematical rules in terms of, of probabilities. So for instance, here you see that the probability that this random lifetime to be absorbed 
is greater than some quantity t that is given by this exponential function, which has some parameter lambda, and then our t. And you see the function of this distribution here. We start with a 1. The probability that the atom is alive when it's born is 1. And then as time goes on, the probability that the atom has actually decayed uh, increases. So the probability that the atom is still alive uh, um, decreases. Suppose now that the atom, we know that the atom has reached an age of, let's say, the t is 1. And we have this atom. And now we want to know what is the probability that it will survive for another year, or another two years, or another quantity which we will term with, with the symbol um, so, so small t again. So, so x, you could think of x as being one year, small x as being one year. So we know the lifetime exceeded one year. What is then the probability that it will exceed another uh, uh, that year and another year and a half, for instance. So that we could take, this must be this part of the original distribution. We can rescale it. So this re red area here, we see again here, it's just rescaled so that the probability mass is again 1. And you see that these two figures are exactly identical. So the exponential distribution is what we call a memoryless distribution. So corresponding to the fact that an atom doesn't know how old it actually is. And that is extremely convenient in mathematics because then we have our mathematical model. We don't need to remember the time. That's the idea. Time does not need to be kept. And you can imagine if I have a mathematical model with a lot of things living at the same time and I had to remember the age of all of them, the model would, would be extremely complex, and it would, and it would be very, very hard to analyze. So that's a good part. We have a good model. The sad part, for, of course, is that very, very few things out in nature are really genuinely exponentially distributed. So in many cases, you will have another distribution, and you have this aim, this goal that you would like to be able to use, your exponential distributions. So the idea which is, is used is to retain that memoryless property by partition our environment in some memoryless exponential st distributed stages. So examples, and this is an example which has actually been used in the literature, it could be a disease. So you have the progression of a disease, it could be a cancer, and then the whole progression of the cancer is maybe not that well described by an exponential distribution, but the model is better if you use it for each stage, and then maybe you can even subdivide the stages and have more exponential components in, in this model. Another model, which is a little bit artificial, but I think it's good for a picture or image of what's going on, is that we could think of cloud cover as something. So you had cloud cover in, in different stages, and then it, it changes. So let's see here again. If we think of this kind of, we have this kind of what I've called in a Markovian environment, then our environment can be in these certain stages. For the disease, the disease could be in stage one, two, or three. And then something could happen. We could have, with certain things happening up here, we could also have that we would have number of arrivals. It could be in the case of the cloud cover, it could be a shower. So you see here, in this case, my Markovian arrival started in 2. It actually stayed there for a very short time. Then it jumped to state 3, which is green. And you see what happened here when it jumped from 3 down to 1. We actually had a rain shower, if that was what we have for the model. And that happened, that happened once again here. And we had another, another shower. So we now have something which is similar to the Poisson process uh, uh, we saw before in the sense that we have these increments of size 1, but also that it's different because at least here it looks like actually the time we have between the increments is more, is more regular. So it's not as variable as a completely random exponential distribution. So let's now go for some mathematics and see how we would model this. So if we have something occurring in in several stages, then we would use in mathematics what we call a matrix. And you could think here of these different lines here. So this would correspond to the bottom line on my previous plot. So this would be the, the red stage. 
This would then be the blue stage and it would be the green stage. And then we would need some kind of, of prescription of which state we should state. So this, this, this quantity here would tell us that we started in the blue, in the blue stage. So this idea, we saw before that for the exponential distribution that the probability that the lifetime would exceed small x was given by this exponential expression. And without going into really the details, you can mathematically express it what at least to the eye appears very, very similarly. And in a sense, it is ex essentially the same. So we work with the concept of the exponential of a matrix. And then you see that the survival function is more or less identically the same. You can see the same pattern. This is actually, well, the first really generally recognized uh, contribution of this idea was due to a Dane, a mathematician, working at the Dane Copenhagen Telephone Company in the start of the previous century. So there was a conference in 2009, which was celebrating 100 years of queuing theory in Copenhagen. And it was actually celebrating Erlang's first paper on the topic. Actually, the, uh, there was a mathematician who was essentially DGU Compute, where I now work, is a merger of many uh, departments. But actually, the founder of one of these departments actually uh, uh, generalized the idea of, of Erlang in a paper. But that paper was more or less overlooked and was not very well known at all when Marcel Newt rediscovered this idea and made extensive contributions to to um, Turing theory and founded a whole school of applied probability called matrix analytic methods. And that's that school you could say I belong to. So you saw before in our in Markovian environment that we actually had more than one lifetime. So we, if we have more than one lifetime, we have a sequence. So here we say the first lifetime is small interval around x1 and so on and so forth. And the only thing I really want you to recognize here is that we have a sequence of these exponential expressions occurring here. So there is a certain interpretation of these expressions in terms of this Markovian environment. However, and now we come to the core of uh, um, what is contribution described in, this, in, in the thesis, and that is that in some cases, this expression I showed bef before would still be a valid probability, but you have lost the connection to the Markovian environment. So that's what you call a rational arrival process. So we now have a, a, a more continuous. So here's a, here is a, a drawing of this. So we now have other variables. I don't have time to really display in the details, but we now have a vector of variables, and you will see that in a small sense, but not directly, this component can at least sometimes be associated directly with the environment before, but, but, but in a different way. And then we will see the development. In a second, we'll see the development. I'll explain this figure then. And then you'll see now a queuing process going on now here. So you see here that this which we variable, which is one of the components, behaves like this, no longer linear. And you see here that you have something going around on some ellipsoid orbits. And down here, you see that we can now have jumps both upwards and downwards. So this is the, the structure. So mathematically, it's very, very similar to what we've seen before. But interpretation-wise, it's different. We need to interpret in a different way. And now you see I've also changed this expression up here a little bit because the D matrices I put here now have a subscript which is plus or minus. And that would correspond, we had jumps here, you may be so. Whenever we jumped and went on a blue orbit, we had a jump upwards. And whenever we jumped and went on a green orbit, we had a jump downwards. So now we actually had, it since a queuing process, we had customers coming into an emergency ward in the hospital and we had customers leaving. So what we have now defined is going back now to, in, for a second, we go back to our Markovian process. And we have now a queue in the Markovian environment. And this is the body of theory which was studied very, very sorrowfully by, by Marcel Newt. So each block here corresponds to how many. Here we have no customers. We have no patients in the ward. This block, we have one, and so on and so forth. 
then you can find this is the probability that you have n customers, n patients in the ward, and you can express this in this mathematical form. So the matrix, this is a matrix here, and this matrix solves a certain matrix quadratic equation, and this is really, uh, I've now mentioned several times, but this is at the core of matrix analytic method, the probability school. So how would one analyze this in the Markovian environment? Basically, you would look at, at, at you would look at jumping from one of the Markovian states to the other, then you will use what you can call a first entrance argument, and then later on, but you will argue in the, in the element-wise, then you collect in, in a matrix form, so you collect all the equations together and get that nice equation. So what would happen if the environment is no longer this Markovian environment, but this rational environment I spoke of before? Then you actually need to do a different approach. You can still, it shows out, it turns out, you can still use this last entrance argument, but you now have to argue fully and only in the matrix framework. It's not possible to, to do the, this more atomic argument which you used before. And here's an example of one of the formulas, which is a key formula in one of, of the contributions. So this is how it was necessary to reformulate the theory in order to be able to, to actually demonstrate that the matrix analytic formula we saw before was still valid. Oops. So, with this, I'd like to finalize with uh, uh, some slides on the last mention, uh, uh, item I mentioned. This, where we actually now take the queuing models and, in a sense, at least sometimes take them out of their proper framework and use them for something else. So, we will see the Markovian environment still a lot but we will think much less of cues. And you see here, uh, um, you see here two different plots. So these are plots. Again, we have these random quantities. You could think of this, I mentioned a financial application as some possibility. So you could think that on a certain uh, uh, normalized scale, that X1 would be the yield you get from bonds, and maybe X2 would be the yield you get from, from stocks. And that would be this tendency that if the interest is low, you might get more from your, from your, from your stocks and, and vice versa. So you will see here that these two things would be what we call negatively uh, um, correlated. They depend on each other in the sense that if one of them tend to be large, the other one tend to be small. And this plot is actually constructed in such a way that each of the variables, if you only zoom in and look at one of the variables, then it's exponentially distributed, the exponential distribution we have seen before. We can also make other plots like this. You see, this is a much more regular plot where the, where the points tend to cluster together. And that could, for instance, be uh, um, the, the value of, of German treasury bonds and Danish treasury bonds, which at least if you're not in a huge crisis, at least over the last uh, three to four, four years, have tend to behave kind of similarly in the sense that if you had, uh, um, if people really believed in German bonds, they would believe in Danish bonds, and then if they start to believe in Berlusconi's bonds, then maybe they would both uh, fall in value a little bit. So these we can actually also get plus like this, we can actually get from our Markovian environment. So you see here we have in our Markovian environment, as we have now seen uh, before, and this is the Markovian environment which relates to a phase type distribution, so it will eventually terminate. And you see it started in the red, then it's changed to the blue. And at first, at the first stretch, we gained reward according to a, a higher slope for the green and a smaller slope for the purple. Then at this point where we had the change from the red to the blue from environment variable one to variable, environment variable two, we saw that now the slopes changed. And at the end, we actually observe here the values. And these values will be our x1 and x2. And this kind of model was actually what generated plots up here. 
So although this could be very simple, you can see that this construction can lead to quite general point patterns, which is, could be usable for a variety of applications in science and engineering. So this is, uh, um, has been, I'm doing other things, but this is really currently my most, uh, um, what, my hottest research interest. It's really where my heart is, is, uh, is beating closest in a scientific sense. And I will explain to you some contributions uh, uh, which this theory has led to. First of all, the first part is uh, Marcel Newt once mentioned, when, once I had a discussion with him, mentioned that most research is really about clarification. So it's not so often that we actually invent new things. A lot of others go into, put it into nicer boxes, explain it, understand things a little bit better. And the first part of the contribution is about that. So there, uh, there is a, a volume on different kinds of these multivariate distributions, models for phenomena which are uh, exponentially distributed marginally, and then bivariate distributed, exponentially distributed if we have two. And then you have a, a related construction called the gamma distribution. And this is also uh, related to the exponential distribution. So there's a lot of papers on these things. And these are summarized in a very, very extensive and very useful monograph by, by Kotz and, oh, Balakrishnan and Kotz and Johnson. I always forget who, of, but I think it's Balakrishnan at first. And they have all these different. But it's not very obvious how these uh, distributions re uh, relates. And some of them, honestly, when I read uh, the book, I cannot see that they are really the same. But out of this research here, the way of structuring, it became obvious that many of these distributions are really the same. So they have appeared under different names and so on. But the classification in this term using the Markovian and Riven and mine has showed you that. So here's an example of such a realization. This is what I call common geometric numbers. So you see here, we can jump back and down be between the, where the Markovian environments. And what is maybe not completely obvious is that we have exactly the same number of blue visits as we will have of red visits. And whenever we are in the red state, we acquire report to the, to the green variable. And whenever we are in the blue, we acquire report only to the purple variable. So that's one of the three constructions. Then there's another construction which can only be used for generating gamma distributed variables. It's not of no real use for exponential variables. And here you see here we have a Markovian environment of three stages. We visit them sequentially. Once we are out, we are done. And you see here, in the first one, we get reward to both variables. Then in the second, we get to only one of them. And then in the final stage, we get only to the third. So you see there will be a tendency that these two endpoints will be close to each other. So they are, again, positively dependent, if you like to call that positively correlated, although correlation only tells part of the story about dependency structures. And this is actually also a, a very useful uh, construction. The last construction I think is harder to really use because it gets really give rise to more odd point patterns. They are not so useful. They are a little bit less uh, natural, but still it's used in many of these constructions. And then you, if you don't look at the exponential, but if you look at the gamma, then it gets maybe a little bit more, more useful. But here, I don't think I'll say too much about that. Again, we have two. And again, here, here the here, the change before, uh, uh, with respect to what you've seen before, is that sometimes we will actually leave after the red stage. So it's possible here that we only visit the red stage and the, then drop out. So that's also part of the construction which, which we have. OK. I spent half an hour by now. I have a little bit more to say. I'll tell you about this. Uh, the other point pattern. I spoke to you about one of the point patterns in, in the first slide where I started on these multivariate distributions. This is the construction we made the other. And this is a work which is described in the thesis, which is joint work with Mohn's Blatt, where we actually managed, using our understanding of this Markovian environment construction, to construct a family of bivariate exponential distributions, 
We haven't extended them to multivariate. I think you, it should be doable, but I think it will. I honestly think it would also be, be very messy. I, have, I haven't thought that much about it. But the strong thing about this distribution class is that, at least from a correlation perspective, you can make bivariate exponentials with any possible correlation structure. So you get a nice distribution, and there are very, very few, most of the distributions in the literature will have positive correlation. So that's one contribution of the thesis. Then for the maybe a little bit more heavy mathematical stuff was that working with this, Moen Splat and I considered what will really be the natural way of defining these distributions. So here's a mathematical definition. I'm not going into full detail with it, but it takes a certain property which is unique for the univariate phase type distributions and their generalization into this rational environment. And then we said, okay, this should also characterize the distributions in the multivariate setting. Having done that, we were able to show a characterization theorem, and that characterization theorem said that a distribution would follow this definition up here, if and only if, whenever you make sums in different ways of these distributions, so that in weighted sums, you get down to a distribution which actually univariately follows this phase type, uh, extended phase type distribution. So this is if and only if. And this result, well, I realize there are also obstacles, but this result gives some hope that you here will get a distribution, a multivariate distribution, which you can actually use for multivariate statistical analysis. And that would be very useful because we have one multivariate distribution governing it all, which is the multivariate normal. And my megalomanic hope is that at some point in time, we would be able to take 1 to 3% of the market share of the multivariate normal. So that's at least what my research life is about for now. Finally, you can actually do this also defining this. You can make the rewards. Until now, I've only shown you positive rewards, but rewards could be negative too. And if you make rewards negative, you actually get the possibility that uh, um, you can define very interesting models which has yet to be explored and studied. So you make now these sums. Again, I don't have time to explain the, the details really, but you make some sums building on the normal distribution, and then you have you have an environment developing, but now the environment can develop much more erratically than linear. And then you observe it over a certain time, and then you get that you actually stay in this class of multivariate matrix exponential distribution, the bilateral version. And if you then stay with the environment, which is kind of a simple environment, similar to what you have, then you can find explicit represent representation, and you will be able to derive what's called moments, which are properties of distributions, which are used very. OK, with all that, I think it's time to, to, to end. So here, what should I do next? Well, maybe at some time you could think that it could be a good idea to go to the hammock and stay in the hammock. But I don't think, actually, I will like to go to the hammock for a very long time. As you can see, I'm very inspired by now by all the applications in queuing, but particularly in, in the bottom part here. So I will definitely spend more time working with the multivariate matrix exponential distributions. There's still a lot to be said about the theoretical understanding. My ultimate goal would be, well, my ultimate goal would be to do applications. And to do applications, we should do estimation, because then we can really bring the field a lot more forward. Besides that, I'll be working. I mean, I'm, you will always, as a scientist, like to work and see your ideas applied. So one year ago, one of you would have heard that I was interviewed for the Danish radio about the application of queuing in healthcare. And I think that's really one thing I would like to pursue. And together with some colleagues, and actually also together with my wife, who's a medical doctor working in the field, we have tried to get money. So far, we have not succeeded. But we are certain that we will succeed. And when we succeed, we hope that we can improve life for patients and relatives and so on. Another application I probably still will be working with, with colleagues in computer science, with these computer science applications. And then, you know, there's a lot of mathematically which you could 
you could do with the completion of these extension results we just spoke about. But in a sense, it's also straightforward. So it's kind of, if you would want to do a, a fun PhD where you would like to do something and you would be certain that it's doable and you would still have challenge in mathematics, then that would be a great area. And of course I could supervise such a PhD student, but I don't think I would, I think I have right now so many other things to do that I would have time, would not have time for that. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you were able to grasp a little bit about what it's all about and hopefully to see that it can also be applied or has potential for applications in society. Thank you very much. Thank you both. So uh, this is the time to call the first opponent to the podium and begin your opposition. Uh, before you start, Bo, could I ask you to turn the microphone around? Yeah, this one? No, this one. Oh, this one. Because oh. we're hearing the resonance of your voice from oh. your upper respiratory tract. Oh, that you should make it. It's interesting, I think. <laughs> it sounds better if it turns the other way around. It just dawned on me that it was probably... Like this? Is this better? I think it's better. Oh. Okay. Oh. So... And you can, you're free to walk around as much as you like. There's some resonance now, but maybe... Uh, someone can take care of that. If I am... Um, can I... Can people hear me if I speak without a microphone? Yeah, no, yes, certainly. Okay, please. Um, all right, so it's, it's my job to ask some questions of, of Bo about some of the technical details and, and also a little bit about where he sees the work fitting in and, and how it might, um, might develop from now on. So, Bo, the first question I want to ask is um, you talked a lot of it about um, the basic ingredients of mat matrix handling methods. So you started off with the Poisson process, you explained how that moved to a, a Markovian arrival process and then a rational arrival process. And, um, and you showed how that these um, can be components of stochastic models. Um, in, your, in your technical um, uh, dissertation, you actually explained the contributions you've made to the theory of these things. And so you talked about um, the... Uh, time reversal of a, of a Markovian arrival process, and you talked about um, the size bias moments and things like this and count. So you've made a number of contributions to these, these things as objects. So um, could you just tell us a little bit about how you see um, those, those things, the time reversal and the size bias moments? Um, why are they important? Well, <clears throat> maybe should I switch off the microphone also? I guess that's better. I'm sorry if my... <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, <clears throat> time reversal is a kind of, well, maybe I should explain a little bit about what uh, um, time reversal is. So, to have time reversal, you could think of one of these Markovian uh, environments, and you should think of that it actually started infinitely in the, in the past, and it will continue until infinitely. Mm -hmm. And then you have, consider what you think of a stationary process, and then you can reverse the process and see how it behaves the other way when you kind of play the movie the, the other way around. So that's a reverse process. Then, a very interesting property of many Markovian models is that sometimes, suppose that you have the movie in, in your home, and you missed it, and now you don't know which way to plug it in, then it will be impossible to realize because the process is what you call it reversible. So statistically, you cannot see, so this is really a modern Hollywood, Hollywood movie, you can't see, see what happens. So that's very, uh, I mean, Peter has made a lot of contributions to product form tuning networks and the product form tuning network reversibility is a very important issue. And it's also, I think for most of us working with stochastic model, is a very nice and appealing property. One of the contributions in the thesis is actually um, using the non-reversibility of some stochastic processes to, to show in something which I told about with these sensitivity results. Another place where you can use it that I had these uh, matrices for the, for the phase type distribution, this D matrix. And sometimes, uh, for instance, Peter mentioned the, the, um, the problem of size bias distributions. 
And for size price distributions, as you start to think a little bit about it, it's obvious that if you have, uh, uh, well, okay, maybe I should, should tell a little bit about what a size price distribution is. So um, I think that one of my favorite examples when I explain this to students in the course in stochastic processes is that uh, suppose that you are a, a, a car producer and you want to tell people what is the, how old will your cars, I mean, how reliable are your cars? Well, then you could sample in different ways. One way of sample would be to stand at the scrapyard and they see, oh, this car is so and so old, so that was that, and then you made it. Take. You could also go out on the street and then you could sample people driving around in Volvo Springs. Oh, how old is your car? I mean, obviously you hit it randomly in time, so then you multiply the time with two, and then you have another set. Are these two the same? No, they are not. Actually, you here see what you could call, uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes you call the inspection paradox, but when you go out and sample by asking people on the street, you will have a higher likelihood of actually sampling the cars which have uh, high, high, uh, uh, live, live, live longer than, than the other ones. And then you need another, another model to capture that. And that's one of the contributions of the thesis, that you take the model for, the model, the statistical model you have when you observe at the scrapyard, and then see, oh, suppose that I now observed during life, and then you can actually see, and then you can easily see that this must be uh, phase type, or at least what I've called matrix exponential. But how would you then find the representation of this thing? How would you find this D matrix? And that's not so obvious. And in order to find that D matrix, the way we approached it was actually to use uh, the reversibility of, of the underlying model. So that's kind of. Uh, and you then uh, yeah. you then showed that various statistics were identical for the forward oh, process that, that's, and the yeah, reverse that's the, process. Yeah, that's true. That that's for the yeah. that that's for the other. So now yeah. I spoke about the yeah. size bias. Uh, another process where. So I was speaking about, so we have these reversible processes. So reversible processes, they are, these are processes which would uh, um, be indistinguishable when you play the movie uh, in the other way around. But that's not always true. But then you have uh, uh, stochastic processes are extremely interesting, extremely versatile, and extremely frustrating because they are, can be so many things, and they are so hard to quantify. quantify. So people build, I do myself also, but I'm also, I mean, it is a challenge for the field. We build these, build these very, very big challenging good models, and then we go out in reality, and then we measure two or three properties and say, oh, now we fit it. So we have a huge, huge, I mean, we have buy a huge computer with a lot of options, and then we use two or three of these options. And one of these options for the, for the, for the process would say that something you call second, first and second order problem. And what Peter Hint said is that if you take such a, pro a process and you reverse it, then first and second order processes will always begin, even if it's not reversible. And that's a problem, because then we have a paper where we demonstrate that a queue can behave extremely different when you put in uh, the process itself or the reverse version. But you cannot distinct distinguish the two processes using these, these uh, descriptors. So that's, uh, yep. that's it. Okay, um, and just staying on the theme of, of Markovian, I mean, we call them Markovian arrival processes, which is a, a, a silly name because they're not always arrival processes. So originally they were used to be an arrival process to a queue, but it turns out that you can actually, um, a lot of Markov models actually generate these processes anyway, and, and one that I'm currently interested in, which I, I'd be interested to see how it relates to your work, is... If you have a finite state Q, maybe a bounded Q, and you look at the departure process, now that is a Markovian arrival process in the sense that Bo's been talking about, but it's a departure process physically. So have you decided, have you in any sense related the various work you've done on, on the various quantities of these Markovian arrival processes to, to pro point processes that arise naturally in the definition of a stochastic model, like, for example, the departure process from a queue. Have I done that? Hmm. 
Maybe you're well, yeah, maybe, I'm not, maybe you're saying yeah. I have something I did which yeah. I don't know. No, um, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm interested in, in your comment on the potential for the sort of work that you've been doing for the analysis of things like that. Oh, I, I think one thing, but I, I spoke, I mean, one thing is that I think that one area where queuing has a lot of potential in, in reality would actually to be to make these kind of sensitivity analysis. I don't know whether that's, mm. that's what you're also thinking mm. about. That we should really, we have queuing systems and stochastic processes are really difficult, but then you can design a queuing system and then you can say, oh, we can control these Markovian arrival processes. And they can be used for many things, as you said. Mm. They can be used at the part process. They can be used as building blocks many places. So suppose that we take them and vary different quantities. And we've seen that we should be very, very careful with which quantities we vary because it's not so easy. I mean, we have these, these different, uh, uh, different descriptors which are not sufficient and so on. And then we can build in a different part of the systems. And sometimes, you know, a queue is really, in a sense, some people say, kind of a filter. So you put in maybe an arrival process, and then something happens, and you get a departure process out of it. So in that sense, there would be some kind of alterations in this, which you would then like, like to describe sure. as a sensitivity. Yeah. yeah, OK, good. All right, move on to a slightly different theme. Because one, if you look at your work over you know, a number of those 19 papers, um, you can see the common theme that you've been very interested in, in um, matrix analytic models that have continuous phase descriptors. So you, you had the paper with Ramaswamy where um, you, you had a transition kernel which you wrote as, as a, a sum of basis functions or in terms of basis functions. And so you guys were the first, person, first people to show how to, to get some sort of analysis out of that. And then later on, much more recently, you've got this paper with Nigel Bean, which you just mentioned a little bit here, which was the wrap with the continuous phase. Reading your thesis, the question came to me is, is there a relationship, and if so, how is there a relationship between that work on the kernel basis functions, which had a continuous phase space, and this, this rational arrival process interpretation where it's moving around. Have you thought about that? Have you got any well, I'll, I'll start to comments? say a little bit of a, So there's a, a second paper, which I'm still, I mean, which I didn't mention here. Well, I mentioned because the formula on, 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 on the second slide was actually from that paper. So mm -hmm. there's a second paper addressing this rap queue question where, um, where uh, Nigel Bean and I analyzed the rap queue in, in a different way. And the idea of it, that there we're using a result by Richard Tweedy, where he actually showed that you could extend uh, the new framework, this matrix quadratic equation, to an operator. Quadratic equation are actually infinite dimensional if you have the uh, G in one structure. And the idea of doing this, you know, Søren Asmussen and Mose Black defined the rational arrival process, and they did that something finite dimensional. And all this work of Ramaswamy with Tweedy, I thought, ah, then we had the problem with the infinite dimensional kernels, which is still a problem, which is really, uh, 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 I really don't know exactly how to, I mean, or I don't know how to solve it, <laughs> just move, move exactly. But for the wrap, you have the finite dimensional. So in that sense, I see the second paper with Nigel Bean as kind of, kind of related. Related in that sense that, the idea of root using the orthonormal basis, well, it turned out that it had to be done differently, though, mm -hmm. in, in, in the rep in the rep question, because you needed, you couldn't really really analyze for the measure. You needed to have these expe expected uh, expected quantities. But there, is, there I see the relation. But the rep also has this um, structure of living on a finite dimensional space. So in that sense, it's. It's restrict, restricted with the sense if you want really, uh, really use the full potential in Tweedy and right to do something which is um, like heavy tailed or things like that because inherently you will stay in the <coughs> more geometric tailed with, with the wrap. But if you, but, but both this this thing with the with the kernel that was uh, you know could write in terms yeah. of a finite number of orthogonal. I mean that's finite dimensional as well. So they're both different finite dimensional descriptors, aren't they? No, because mm. in the work with Ram, the, the theory was not finite dimensional. The theory mm. was infinite dimensional. But whenever we had to do numerics, yeah. 
we needed to do to yeah, find right. out. So that's the, yeah. so okay. so so the point was that suppose that you could come up with a kernel where another relation which is not really so strong, but you have this challenge with these matrix analytic methods, no mat matrix analytic exponentials and rational arrival processes, then you can define them and they are much better suited for statistical estimation. But then when you have a model, you don't know whether it's a probabilistic model. And that's really annoying. So then you have, now you can do statistics uniquely, but you don't know what, <laughs> you, know what you get. And uh, um, the other way around, uh, with phase time, you can do statistics, but you don't have uniqueness and all these things. And you have the same things with the kernels. At least up to now, when you need, when you want to do numerics, you have to truncate your kernels. But, but the theory works fine for, for infinite right. dimension. Okay. All right. Um, and the final part of your talk, you mentioned multivariate yeah. matrix exponential, multivariate phase type distributions. And, and you hinted at the generality and the relationships, but um, for the benefit of the audience, there's a, there's a bit of a, a literature out there, and there have been a number of people who have come up with different suggestions for how to define these things, and your one is probably the latest and, and most comprehensive, but could you just tell us all a little bit about maybe the history of, of how your relationship, um, how your definition of the multivariate matrix exponential or so, phase type relates to these other definitions that other people have put sure, up. Sure, sure. So mm. to the best of my knowledge, and you know, I mean, as a researcher, you should, you should know all the literature, but it's also, you know, quite, quite a challenge. Mm. So to the best of my knowledge, there are only three main contributions to multidimensional phase type distributions. And the first one was very, very naturally bound, bounded very, very closely to the original phase type distribution of mass and, mass and mutes or Arnigans, if you like, but let's say mass and use. So you have this Markovian environment, and you have these rewards, but you could say in a sense that re rewards were restricted to be one. So that was one particular restriction. And then you also had something that if you accumulate a reward, you would accumulate a reward to error until you didn't do it anymore, and then you would stop. So with all these lines running in parallel, and then one of them would stop, or sorry, go up here, and one, they would all go like this, one of them would stop, the other one would stop, and so on. So that was the only restriction. And that was, the, uh, um, for like four years, the, the, the only, the only uh, suggestion. And it has a few nice properties. And one of the nice properties is that there you can actually explicitly state the density function. So that's very good. Because that's a problem for the other one. So, so that's, that's really good. But it's very, very messy. And it's hard to really define even what should the underlying Markovian environment, how should that look, and so on. So it was really cumbersome and, and awkward. Then, built on that, came this, which is really the one I've primarily spoken about. All my examples is a contribution by uh, um, uh, researcher Kulkani, who had this, that uh, my picture, the picture I showed, you have these Markovian environments, and you have different rewards, all linear in, in different ways. So this was Kulkanius, and most of the distributions which are found in this book by Peter Christian, Cotton, Johnson fits into this Kulkani framework. So in general, everything fits into the Kulkani framework, and they also closed on the projections and so on in the Kulkani framework. So um, one thing is that the Kulkani framework is maybe, well, you can extend, most Ben and I have extended it to the, to the matrix exponential case also, but... Uh, it's a little bit hard to, I mean, to honestly, to this day, I don't fully understand what it means. So that's one of the, that's one of my say where you can really understand what's going on with when, when, when it's, uh, But it's also not, in a sense, mathematically complete. There's a small parallel to this of extension, ex these extension results which I spoke about, that also you like to see what should be the most complete class we would like to find. And then Owens and I sat down and found that we would really, uh, determine the class in terms of the transform, because there's also this uh, characterization result for the transform for the matrix exponential distributions. So, and then we defined, and then we showed that we have the characterization result, which honestly is also true for the sub subclass of Kulkani. So, so I mean, you, that's not a full argument for, for the extension, but I still think it's, 
its value. But then you could use it to define yet another way. You stay in multivariate phase time. And then we define a class of distributions, which I guess is larger than Kulkarnik's class. And that is, now we use the characterization result as a definition. So now we define a multivariate phase time distribution as a distribution where it's true that all projection, linear projections are still multivariate phase time. So that's it. And we know that it must be a subclass of the multivariate matrix exponent as it should be because of the characterization result. And so can you, I mean, the, some of these are strict subclasses of yeah. others, aren't they? So yes. you believe this, this distribution in terms of the transform definition or indeed the projection definition is likely to be the most general, sensible definition of such things? Yes, yes, yeah. I really think so. And I know for sure that if you go to the bilateral, where we allow negative rewards, then I know that it is strictly bigger than, mm -hmm. than the one with the linear. But it's really, it's really annoying, and uh, I guess my family would know about the Kulkarni conjecture. <laughs> so <laughs> for several years, that was one of the most important members of the family. <laughs> right now, it's, it is still there. They don't know, but it's dormant. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and maybe I just had a, a one other sort of major question to ask, which relates. Can we can we pull up maybe your slides 11, 12, 13? And this is just because looking at those nice di maybe this one? no the next. Uh, even the next one, because it's the nicest one. Mm -hmm. Or the three, yeah. No, the one after that, maybe. This one? That one, yeah, why not? Um, I mean, looking at these, it just sparked off something um, in my mind, which is an association between something that I'm... So this is, I'm being a little bit selfish here, because it's some of the stuff <laughs> I've been thinking about. But one way to look at this is, you've got your modulating process state J. And when you're in state J, if you think of X1 and X2, well, you've got them separately plotted against time there. Mm -hmm. But another way to think of this is that when, you're in, when J of T is in 1, the red state, X1 and X2 are moving in two dimensions. So you could imagine X1 and X2 plotted together and there's some, some vector going off in, in a certain direction which keeps on going as long as that J of T stays in a mm -hmm. state. And then it moves to the blue state, mm -hmm. and it, the vector heads mm -hmm. off in another direction, which in this case has yeah, got... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, got so you have a movement in the plane. X1. Or in the, yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yes. could actually think of this whole thing as, as a two-dimensional sure. stochastic yeah, fluid yeah, model. Yeah, yes. Now, you're asking a particular question about this two-dimensional stochastic fluid model, which is there's an, a, 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 an absorbing state, yeah. which is when it stops. And then you're asking the question, where does it end up? But in general, two-dimensional stochastic fluid models are very interesting. And there's a lot of other questions you can ask about them. And, and in fact, one of the things I would love to know is, um, well, I know about stability, but I would love to know how to write down its stationary distribution. So just looking at stationary distribution in two dimensions. But then, um, of course, you need some kind of reflection or something, right? I mean, then you need... You need to worry about what happens if it yeah. comes out. I mean, yeah. here you've got these things either staying flat or increasing. But yeah. as you mentioned, you yeah. could have them decreasing. Yeah. You could have it so that sure. with probability one, they will go back down to zero. And maybe when they hit zero, they stay at zero until... Yeah, well, if, you, if you need stationarity, yeah. you need some kind of reflection so yeah. that they could... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But so, I guess my question is, have you thought about this type of structure as two-dimensional fluid models? Uh, I have thought about it very much in the sense of points moving in the plane. So in that sense, I have. And I also, also thought that, well, I am not so much on top on the literature on fluid models. But I have thought about it. And I also, so the way I think, I, the question, because I'm trying to approach it mm -hmm. from my end and from the multivariate, so I said, under what conditions when you observe the fluid process, will you have that the observation point is still bilateral and multivariate matrix? So what are the conditions to still have this rational transform? That I've, I mean, I have posted as a research question, but I haven't yeah. really gone into it. But that's, once, that's where I would start. And whenever I see people doing, you know, these things like Miyazawa doing these things, I'm thinking about, ah, 
how would I do it? How could, could I have? Uh, but I have not really done it. But I have, you know, it's, it's been in my mind. And, yeah. So what would happen if indeed you had that? You allowed these, um, these rates to be negative in mm -hmm. some of the states. So they could, in fact, decrease. Sure. But you mentioned you could do it on the whole real yeah. line. But let's forget about that. Let's think about just doing it on the, on the positive orthant. But if you then had... I mean, what hap what would you still be able to develop, um, define matrix exponential bivariate distributions in a way you have if you took into account the fact that when it, one of these things hit the boundary, it stayed at the boundary? I'm pretty sure not. I'm pretty sure that in that sense you leave this rational. You don't no longer have the rational. I mean, of course you can define it this way, yeah. but you would no longer have this property of the transform being rational. That I'm more or less certain about. But I haven't. That's one thing I would like to look into. So it would be yeah. It would be yeah. like having a negative slope, say on the purple one. Yeah. That when so it hit zero, stayed at stay zero. there, and, and, that's, and then and it only recovered if it went it, to a different state. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. And and that that I think you would not be able to to capture with a rational transform. Mm -hmm. So I've thought a little bit about it, but I have really not done the analysis. I mean, it, I would imagine it would have positive mass on the axis. Mm -hmm. Because it could be stuck there when, you, when it gets absorbed. Something like that. Yeah, so. but then you have to, you know, then you all of a sudden... Now you have this nice... Also, if you take a look at the... Um, Now the most general theory on about You still have this, you know, that in a sense you have. Oh. Is there anything coming? Oh, I can't point from the mouse instead. What is multidimensional in many sense? But you still have this kind of, but, well, a multidimensional kind of stopping time where you stop and observe. So you don't have something happening in one of the processes and then the other one going on and so on. Mm -hmm. So one of them hits zero and the other one continues on. <coughs> that kind of structure is at least by now not, not uh, uh, captured by, right. the, by the rational. Term. And I think, I don't, I don't think it would work with the rational. Mm -hmm. So it would maybe be interested to try and construct the thing and see what the yeah, distribution yeah. of those points actually is. Yeah, that would be very, very yeah. interesting. And that's also, I mean, as I said, it's one of the things I haven't done, but I was interested. But also where I would, I am quite certain that we would have to leave. I mean, that's not a reason for not doing it. That's not at all not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that my, my feeling and my intuition is that we would then go into another distribution class and we would leave. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll talk about it. Yes, that's sure. OK, that's all the major questions I have. OK, so. Uh, then I think we should probably, uh, considering that we've been here for a little more than an hour, give the audience a chance for a quick break before we take the second opponent. The second part of the opposition is Professor Gila Tush, I hope I pronounced it You're very so, good. so right, very well. who will discuss with the board. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, First thing I would like to, uh, to tell you, Bo, is about the quality of your thesis. I think it was really a joy to read this text with the uh, 19 semi-independent technical papers who were there, some of whom I had read before, but not all of them by far, but also the synthesis that you, you, you put in front of it, which helped to cover the diversity of the topics you have been studying over these 20 years and also indicate the common theme in the way you are thinking about your research. I think this is a very interesting, it was to me a very interesting uh, thesis to read and I really appreciate the opportunity of having been invited uh, to read it. So I, I really thank you very much for this. Uh, in your very first slide, you mentioned that, the, in a way, the origin of the problems that you were thinking about was from queuing theory and risk analysis. And, and I think this, you really pointed out some of the uh, usefulness of that. And some of the feature of, of both of these things is that there are tools for theoreticians to uh, 
develop new theorems, do new mathematics, but also at the same time, we think that there should be some application behind, or there are applications behind, and so the two, the two are always present together. And I mention this because, as you know, uh, part of my uh, interest in these subjects are both the theoretical stochastic aspect of things and the fact that there is numerical algorithms to be developed uh, behind it. So uh, clearly this is going to be the bias in my comments <laughs> to you and you should not be uh, very surprised mm. but neither should the audience be surprised that that's going to be part of the, the questions I'm going to, uh, to raise. And uh, the first one is really about, uh, about this sensitivity analysis that you've been doing about uh, curing pro processes and uh, Markovian processes to describe the uh, arrival of customers to the queue. Uh, Peter has already, excuse me, <coughs> Peter has already mentioned it a, a, a bit. But my, my question is more about, not my question, first my comment is that these matrix methods are really nice because they open the way to a lot of sensitivity questions. What if, oh sorry, <coughs> what, is, what if this would happen and so on. And this you have done brilliantly because you have been thinking about very uh, deeply thought, thought experiments and then implemented them and then looking at the results and, and hunting for results which would not necessarily be obvious. <coughs> but this, this, the side effect is how do you know that a model, an arrival model, is going to be good if, the, uh, if you can have two different processes which have <coughs> the same characteristics that you can define and still give different results <coughs> when being applied to a queue. Have you thought about this question? How, how about characterizing a process beyond those characteristics that you had been thinking of? But, <coughs> at the point um, where the paper with the reversal of map was reading, uh, written, it was really I was thinking, there's something at the end of this paper, right? Trying to then at least use higher order. Let's then go for, at least go for uh, moments, characteristics, which we know at least will respond differently. So now, now, we, have, now we have identified one anomaly. Let's at least make something which can respond to that. So that's kind. But that's really how far it got in that sense. And I haven't seen anybody really catching up on that. In that sense, I think it's, 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 really a, a, it's really a challenge to the field. And at that point, at that point I was thinking that that is maybe for the application of queuing theory. I think that what came out in my mind of this uh, map reversal study was that maybe one needed to do something which is, was more, you know, natural science and not mathematics in the sense that you needed to have characterization of point processes which was um, area dependent. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we would need, if we're going to model health care applications, well, we would think that we have good reason to believe that at least to some extent the Poisson process would work, right? Then there's some things. Right? So, but there's also characteristics which we do not know and we need to do extensive statistical analysis. And the same kind of thing would be, would be needed also for, um, for other areas. In, in telecommunications, I mean, it's when probably, I mean, even, I mean, this, uh, the scary part you could say of the map reversal study is that it, it was a three state map which caused the problems, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so suppose now, I mean, I think it's very naive to think that then we cook, cooked up some already not cooked up because it was the obvious first next step to take these ratios with third order moments. But 
I guess that it would probably take a little bit longer, but it would not like take that long time to copy an example which would have identical oh, third yeah. order properties yeah. and then something. Yeah, would that's be. for sure. It's not a question of just adding one more. No, it's, no, so it's something which is beyond. It's something which is beyond, yeah. which is very, and you know, before the map reversal, we had this idea that, okay, if we capture signal order properties of the arrivals and the intervals, ah, then we are probably going to be safe. But obviously not, because of yeah. the map reversal. So I've been thinking about that, but I've also think it's, it's in a sense, uh, very challenging. And it's also the place where, I mean, Hopefully we primarily have one, but that's at least one Achilles heel in Turing theory is that uh, there's too little uh, joint work with statistics, right? So there's something here where, at least for the application, we must go out and understand what's going on. And it is probably uh, content dep dependent. It has to be for some areas, some models. And it might also be that hopefully that a lot of the NM, NM, uh, an anomalies will be in mathematics, that reality is is uh, evil, but not that evil. So hopefully we can get to a point where there's, at some point it ends, right? We, we could construct, ah, then we twist it, and then we twist it, but at some point nature stops, okay, I'm done. I mean, I'm tired of teasing you or something like that. So, so I think that's uh, uh, the way I think it, it, it should be addressed. But yeah. I also think that this is a point where the map is an extremely strong tool because it would be very hard to find these things with other tools than the map because we really have very few other models which we can actually calculate numbers from. Yeah, I mean, this is a very good point. Nature is not necessarily as nasty as we, as we could no. be in our... <laughs> but so, so that brings another question to mind. <coughs> Did you try any of these uh, sensitivity analyses on the examples that you got uh, from real applications? I'm pretty <coughs> sure. I'm pretty sure it's not in there. Well, actually, I don't, I don't think we put that in the paper, but I actually think that we tried with the Bellcore data, and to the extent that we tried, they seemed non-reversible. That's how I remember them. But that's, that's uh, I mean, so many years ago, yeah. and I'm pretty sure we didn't we didn't report on it, and so on. So that's. But of course, also then you come into very difficult questions. When is it? When is the um, deviation from non-reverse? Is that statistically significant? And that's these are actually challenging questions which we should be able to answer, but we are not really at the stage where we can answer those for sure right now. But yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I would. I thought I would be able to uh, go on, and uh, I discovered that all of a sudden my throat is... <coughs> so uh, I will keep it as short as I can. Oh, but uh, that's but, uh, what, yeah. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, there are a few things I would like to, uh, to mention. And, and the, uh, the, the next point I wanted to, uh, to bring up and, and listen to uh, your comments is about uh, is one that you made actually in, in the comments. It's a, a comparison between the phase type, the stochastic phase type representation, and the matrix exponential. And you said about the matrix exponential that it was very difficult to know that you had a representation of a, of a uh, probability distribution. And for the uh, stochastic phase type representation, it was very difficult to design an estimation procedure. <coughs> or an efficient one? No, it's, it's, it's easy. I mean, there are, I mean, for instance, the uh, uh, expectation maximization process. The, the, the problem is the uh, um, over-parameterization of phase type distribution. So it's difficult to make statistical inference. <coughs> So it's difficult to make uh, uniquely okay. defined parameters. That's Estimation was not the point. It was about inference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but also in a sense, you estimate. But I mean, there's this paper by on the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods by mm -hmm. Blatt and Gonzalez and and, and Lawitson, where they actually aim for not estimating uh, the parameters, but they aim for estimating the functionals. Yeah. 
Because you have MCMC, so you cannot rely on the parent because you would jump around representation. So what you do is that you estimate then a functional in a phase type. Yeah. Okay? But and still, sense you have the problem of, uh, of non-uniform, I mean, non-uniqueness. If, if you really wanted the parameters, their approach wouldn't help you that mm -hmm. much either, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. But my, my, my question was a little bit beyond that. I mean, let's assume that we have a procedure to, uh, to, to get something which is a matrix exponential, yeah. and we know it is a, a yeah. probability distribution. So we have something which we can then use in algorithms. Mm. And one of the uh, features that uh, are very good about all the uh, stochastic phase type representations is that they lead to algorithms which are numerically uh, inherently stable in the sense that whatever you compute in going to your solution has to have, you very often, has to have physical meaning mm -hmm. and therefore remains constrained not to yeah, become yeah. too too wide. Yeah. And in uh, with the matrix exponential representation, this is no longer the case. Because, because what you are doing has an indirect physical representation, but it's not clear whether what you are doing in between <coughs> will be so no, no, no. so uh, so represented. So my I see that you've got two evils in the sense. One is how do you do inference, and the other one is how do you ensure that computation is stable. Do you have any idea about which one of the two evils you are going to be uh, living most easily with? Oh, I now am able to check that the distribution is matrix exponential. That I oh, I think that I would personally. Um, personally uh, uh, live with the problem of uh, uh, maybe only slight, slightly increased problems in, in the computation. Mm. When, where you're going to, when you can apply a, a matrix exponential with advantage, you could also have a huge uh, dimension reduction in, with respect, as respect to the phase type. So you're right that you have this, I mean, uh, certain places in the algorithm, we are no longer sure, well, we're not sure that we have probabilities, but if you have your magic tool, which can tell you that you are matrix exponential, then you also can use your magic tool to check for the soundness of your algorithm. You could also say, have I left or something? Because you would have the same kind of probability, now you would have the same kind of probabilistic interpretation, now in terms of these means, and you have to be into the contours and so on, and that you could check with that too. So that should solve that at the same time. Then, well, this is of course very, very strict. But so far, Nigel Beans and my uh, uh, computation experience has been that, I mean, it's just a staple. And, yeah. and, and also, well, this is of course much, much more your area than my area, but the problem, you know, of um, the addition of small numerical errors called of the com uh, computer precision must be larger when you have a huge matrix than when you have a small matrix. So that's kind of uh, the round out of areas should, I guess, c accumulate uh, a little bit more in the, in the huge dimensional uh, uh, map pH framework than in, in the rap ME framework. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit more in terms of, uh, of theoretical stability analysis of the computation. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I'm going to give one yeah, example yeah, yeah. which was not really uh, in your thesis, but in the algorithm to compute the matrix R, <coughs> one is to use cyclic reduction mm -hmm. like uh, Bertucci and uh, Dario Bini are doing. And another one is to move to uh, a, a complex space, plane, and do there a different, uh, it's called, uh, I forgot now, yeah. Uh, I forgot what, what is the term, but it's, it's another algorithm which essentially is being you have the same sequence of operation, but project it in, in a different plane. And as a result, the uh, parameter values which are demonstrated to lead to numerical instabilities are different. And, uh, and, and, and usually are less when you are remaining with the, uh, with the original stochastic representation. So I thought 
That might be uh, maybe not for you because you have already explained to us all that you are going to do, uh, <laughs> but uh, that might be uh, some something to uh, to push research into because maybe yeah, yeah. It draws the attention of somebody, some linear algebra. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. Person. But that 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 uh, I mean, that's well. One thing which really bothers me a lot, and that is that we have not really been fully or not really been able to solve this meaning of the minimum non-negative solution. What is that in the RAP ME framework? And that's, uh, I think I have some understanding of what I think it is, but it's not really satisfactory. So that's, that's very much in that. I mean, that should maybe be solved at least a part of maybe before some of these things. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really surprised, uh, positively surprised by seeing, well, these are small examples though, but, but there's also examples where you really have the density at zero, right? But I was surprised how well logarithmic reduction worked for, for our examples. So, so, um, but you definitely be that, I mean, if one really wants to use the RAP ME framework, then there should definitely also be research into the numerical mm -hmm. stability. I mean, I, yeah, I fully agree and yes. That could be interesting, but I think I could more, I mean, I probably have some insight in, in these problems, but the numerical analysis and precision is probably not where I'm, I'm the... Yeah, I, the, I, I'm the, usually yeah. discovering it through somebody else's yeah. because yeah. it's not my, yeah. uh, my strong point either, no, but no. I, I thought these are interesting properties yeah, to, yeah, put, yeah, yeah, yeah. to put to life. But it could be something to discuss with Dario or, yeah. or Beatrice actually, yes. Yeah. That could be, yeah. Okay, and my last comment or set of comments would be about your last slide. I mean, the, uh, the uh, illustration the, the, is on your last slide. The, the very last slide. Yeah, the very last, yeah. This one? Yeah, okay. So, uh, for the people who would not know it, I'm going to emphasize this gray picture, <coughs> which is a little bit ugly, but really interesting. So this is an example of uh, a case where the phases, the states of the underlying uh, Markov process are continuous. And there has been a discussion by Peter about this already. And uh, this is one of the results which appear in a paper that uh, Bo has written with Ramaswamy 15 years ago. It appeared, I think, in ICC in Washington 97. Wasn't it, wasn't it 97? Yeah. yeah, okay. So it's Maybe like, yeah. yeah. And I have been interested in that paper ever since they wrote it. I never wrote, worked very hard on it, but I have been interested because I think it's really a, a wonderful idea. My problem with your paper is that you stopped halfway. <laughs> you said, Let's assume that we have a process and that the transition matrices, the transition functions, may be expressed in an orthogonal basis. Let's assume. And then everything works. And to produce these examples, they created transition kernels which were expressed in terms of uh, orthogonal basis. And my question is, when you are given the kernel, not the representation, how do you construct the representation? How do you find a good orthogonal basis and how, how do you construct the representation in that basis? I think it's a really a, a, a difficult question, but maybe you have thought about it. Uh, well, one thing is that if I really had a very good solution, had good ideas, then I would probably have uh, <laughs> done, done, done more in on more in that direction, right? So, but since you have been saying that you are planning to work on these questions, maybe uh, that might be hidden in the question mark. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, but uh, these were actually more, you know, the, the rap mesh matrix. Yes, yes. I imagine. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, I know, I mean, you have been start to look at these things with the wavelet functions, right? Uh, yeah. Recently, very recently, recently right. but, yeah, yeah. but uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. have been thinking about yeah, it. Yeah. We have been trying uh, with yeah. Lothar Brower 10 years ago. 
with uh, Fourier transforms, yeah. and it didn't work very well. But I don't know whether it's because we were non -comp not competent in dealing with uh, Fourier transforms but or I mean, because of the intrinsic instability of the early coefficients. I mean, but, but, but basically, I mean, you need some function space where, where, where you have this orthogonality, and that, that could be, I mean, mean, mean any, right? So, so uh, it's in the estimation of the coefficients. In the coefficients, that we had problems. But, but if you have, uh, bef because you don't design the curve, because the way we did was kind of, I mean, as you said, the reverse engineering, right? We we have a kernel of this form, and then we have the kernel of this form. Then of course it's obvious that that you have the, I mean, you can calculate from from the inner product what yes. the coefficient should be, and so on. So. Uh, but I really don't. So, so what? What is your starting? Your starting point is that you have a. a well, we we have a transition kernel, which is expressed in terms of uh, distribution of y given ah, x. Ah, so it's not directly expressed. Ah, no, yeah. Ah, so you ah you, you you do the right thing. So you start with the function, which yeah. is not, and then you're thinking what what should be the basis for for what should yeah. be the basis functions. That's what you are. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. What yeah. Okay. Mean, yes. Yeah. What should be the choice of basis functions? I guess the, f the first answer is very standard mathematician, if you don't know the answer, is that it should depend on the case. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, because you have been using two different sets yeah, of yeah, the yeah, base yeah, functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so, so, so you're not just no, saying No, 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 I know. It was, it was, you have yeah, demonstrated yeah, yeah. it, yes. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think maybe that that's point where, where we, I mean, at least if I should do more, I would go move out of our field and find somebody who's an expert in, in, in functional analysis. What are good choices of, I mean, what are good choices? Do we need to be, uh, we probably need to be in a Hilbert space, and, but could we do other things, and what should we do? And, and, and I was quite intrigued by, by, the, by the wavelet idea, actually, because I saw that you might be able to get much, it was really a trouble for us to get kernels which uh, we could assure were, were um, were non 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 negative, and there at that point I experienced problems. I mean, uh, trying yeah. to trying to get too close to zero, uh, the algorithm started to break down. Yeah. So, so that's uh, that's what uh, I, I spoke about the map in uh, RME where it just worked surprisingly well, and it was whenever you had the same, you should expect the frame salt because it was still a phase type, just huge dimension. We got exactly the same in much shorter time. Yeah. But working with these things, we got kernels which had no probabilistic interpretation and the negative mass would be 0.2 or 0.1 or something, far too much that you would like. I mean, not that you could just say. So, so that was very, very, very hard to work with an experiment and yeah. So you mean that the, uh, the representation in the orthogonal basis is so different from the wrap ID I, I was thinking that maybe you had been demonstrating with the rational and matrix exponential approach that these kind of things could also have some sort of... No, uh, but, but, but the very, very, very nice thing in the wrap matrix exponential is that we have this finite dimensional space. So we only have the numerical problem. Uh, we yes. have a probabilistic model because we are in finite dimension. Then some numbers could be negative, which we are used to. But other people, they would use eigenvalue decomposition and don't know whether it, I mean, and sometimes yeah. it will even work, right? And here we actually use uh, algorithms we are known to be stable under the norm. And maybe if you do some research, you could, might actually be able to prove that within the RAF framework, they are more or less yeah. stable. But with the orthogonal basis, it's different. We have to do something. We have a truly infinite dimension. And we space. need to truncate. And we need to yeah, truncate. Yeah. So that's very, very different. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. That brings me to my very last question. Mm -hmm. uh, although I have recovered my <laughs> voice, uh, it's still going to be my very last question. I think it is very difficult to find real examples of discrete time processes with continuous phase transitions. Uh, it seems to me that the examples where you get these continuous mm -hmm. phases inherently come from continuous time processes. 
I would, you, would you comment on this? I think that that's... Uh, uh, well, I mean, if you think mathematically, if you think of, of, of uh, um, my, my last paper with, with Nigel, you could simply think that, that we have these discrete transitions and we have the transition kernels, so they could have their own life. So you could simply define a, a discrete... I, 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 I think that you could easily have discrete... I mean, actually, the way we solve it is by discrete... Time. Because you discretize time. We do, because the, okay. we need to discretize time because otherwise we cannot apply, apply uh, treat this model. And we could just have said that that is the model. And there's no underlying... Uh, 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 here we say, oh, in reality we have an underlying continuous model. Okay, then we derive the embedded and then we need to go back. So we okay, so you really started from a continuous time We started process, from continuous time, moved time. into discrete time, and get back. We could okay. just have stayed in discrete time, started in discrete time, and stayed in discrete time. So that would have been possible. Okay. So that's not... So discretization of time is really to make use of 3 uh, Yes, general, yes, uh, that, that's, yeah. that's why that was needed, definitely. And that's not so much work on the matrix geometric distribution, in a sense... Uh, in, not in the matrix geometric formula, but the matrix geometric solution, which yeah. is the parallel to the discrete phase types. That doesn't so much work, but, but that theory goes, goes through also, and you could formulate in, in, in that. And there's a lot of interesting things to be understood there. Also, in this, you know, uh, uh, Miklos Telek made this reason slightly progress towards uh, finding, uh, you know, extending these uh, Kumu Mukano results and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's something there to, to be understood. That's something which, and that I would very much, that, that's under the hidden of completion <laughs> of extension results, I guess, which I would like to do. So that's. So you've got several question marks. I, I have uh, more than one. I, I think that maybe uh, when, when I put the question mark, I was only thinking of what I was not, probably not going to do. But there's also something in the question mark which I would like to do. So that's, that's another. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now is the time for questions from the audience. But the first question we already have had announced, and that is Professor Knut Connorsen. So, Knut, please come forward. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, 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 an extremely uh, good work you have uh, uh, presented here, Bo, where you have a lot of very interesting results. With my background, uh, the first chapter I looked upon was, of course, the one about multivariate uh, distributions. And uh, you start by saying that uh, if we have independent components, uh, the distribution is a product of the marginal distributions. So far we agree. You say <laughs> that uh, this will not always be the case. And uh, then we are beginning to enter into a little bit more troubled water. You say, well, if we can make a parametric model, we might use a multivariate normal distribution. If that does not work, uh, we are in the realm of non-parametric methods. But you think you have a solution there, or an in-between solution, you say, that uh, maybe my models could be semi-parametric models that could solve some of these uh, problems. Could you develop a little bit more on that? Sure. So, I think also when, when, when I teach, in, I, think it's, I think that's the frustrating part of the feed. It's also true in statistics, but it's more true in stochastic processes, that you have all these nice models, you understand everything, you can calculate everything. It's nice, it's good, nice models, nice to teach. Then you twist the assumptions a little bit, Oops, you jump out, you can simulate. I mean, that's, I mean, kind of. And you didn't do so much. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's really frustrating. And in a sense, for multivariate statistics, well, it's not, to the extent that I have studied and known, well, you have the same thing. You have the multivariate normal distribution. Well studied, very strong, can be used for a lot of things. Whenever it's applicable, you should use that. I mean, without doubt. But then you have all these models, these huge data applications and so on. And people start to do all sorts of kernel models and something, and they are far beyond really doing any kind of statistical test and model reduction and so on. And there, here we have a, a model which is a purely probabilistic model. We can calculate. We have the pro projection result. We can at least know, understand, well, at least for the univariate, it's very, very well understood how we characterize it in terms of moments. Well, 
We might not always like moment methods yet. I mean, the normal distribution is also determined in terms of moments. So, so that's, that, that, that could be acceptable. And then we need to understand more how the higher dimension models can be understood in moments. That's hard work that will take time. That, that should be doable. And then the hope is that you can take and put this, and that's why I spoke about my 1% to 3% of, of uh, market share. Yeah, put these models in there and do that and make them work and have something where you can say a little bit more. You will still be, you will not be as fully on the ground as you'll be in a normal distribution, never. But you could be closer to that than you are now with other models. You could do something more, calculate uh, residual probabilities and things like that. That's at least my, my dream and, and my hope that that should be possible. So the market share from the multivariate normal distribution, or is it a market share now taken up by people using kernel methods? Some of it probably comes from the people using kernel methods. So that's, that, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's admitted, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think you said it, but uh, try to repeat. What would the advantage be by using your semi-parametric methods oh, over that, kernel methods? Then you can now quantify things much more. You can say, is this different? Now, you don't have to look, look at it. I mean, it's a little bit like, uh, I'm going a little bit into a field I don't know that, but I have, I mean, le read papers and things like that. So it's a little bit like what if you should make a, a caricature of people in queuing theory that we make all this theory and then we have some data and then we fit second order properties. And it's a little bit, you have huge, very, very advanced models and so on, but it's really when you're going to adjust them against each other, it's really uh, you make a plot and say this looks better and so on to some I mean, and at least. My hope is that we could uh, bridge that gap a little and do a little bit better and quantify a little bit more. That's, that's the ambition. Could I interpret it that you were also a little bit afraid of overfitting uh, with these uh, kernel methods and that you might obtain a, a more, well, in our sense or in our world at least, a more correct uh, reduction of data uh, using probability. Yeah. And here's the idea that the projection result might be able to help us. That when we reduce, we could use projection resolve. So that's really the, where uh, the hope, uh, the idea is hinged on that, that we could apply it, maybe not completely, but at least to some extent, and we have something, okay, here we can do something. So that's, yeah. Do you have any uh, more specific cases in mind that we could uh, employ an idle student on working with? I mean, uh, or is it still uh, uh, far away in the sky? Are your ideas so specific that uh, have you been inspired by them? Well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, um, David Meisch, who's my PhD student who's sitting there, he's, he's actually working with a concrete model. I'm working with one of these models I present here and doing estimation of this and so on. So that is work going on. I have a previous PhD student who did a, a little bit more, which David had built on and expanded a lot and so on. And these model, this model is, is also used for radar image data and so on. So there could be ideas and, and uh, ways to start and, and some of it is. Uh, but there's still also a long way to go. Uh, saying anything else would be a little bit uh, on, in honest. Yeah. Just adding to the question mark, you know, yeah, maybe yes. even for other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but that goes beyond, you know, that's the motivation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay, so this is, yes, we have, no? I saw a little hand, but it quickly came down. Anyone else who would like to ask a question or both? I noticed with some amazement that even your children have typed, set, and uh, helped you correct your thesis, so maybe yeah. some of the family would like to ask <laughs> questions of their father, since you know the material so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Well, I'm not going to, to, to put any undue pressure on any of you, but then again, this is a day of celebration, so you are free to ask questions, even those questions that are not carefully thought through, as we say. But uh, if that is not the case, then we are getting closer to the end of this session, and I'll just make sure that I explain to all of you correctly what is going to happen from now on, because we should not celebrate too early, then again, never miss an opportunity for a celebration, but just to explain what's actually going to happen. So now we have finished this official opposition session. Uh, the two opponents will, with me, shortly decide whether you have 
answer their questions in a satisfactory way, fitting for a doctor technicist. And if they agree, they will put a signature on a piece of paper, which will then go to the academic council that will finally decide whether you will be awarded the doctor technicist degree. So therefore, we cannot say with 100% certainty, I guess I can say that in this audience, <laughs> but I think it is highly statistically significant, <laughs> likely, or whatever you say, that Bo will be awarded the degree. And therefore, I also think that we can, when we close this session, go outside and celebrate a little bit prematurely <coughs> with a glass of wine or whatever you like and a little bit of food. And I would also like to uh, present you uh, with some flowers in recognition of your you hard work so far. I would say congratulations a little bit prematurely. I would also like to say that as for Dr. Technicist degrees, we have no queuing problem. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there are much too few. This is a good year because this is actually the second. But this is a very rare event, and what you have done is something very unusual and very much appreciated by the university. So thank you very much for your hard efforts, and let's go outside and celebrate both, and uh, in due time, you will formally be awarded the degree. Thank you. Congratulations.